Goodbye Pier 62 here at the Chelsea Piers because we are off to a journey along once again the Hudson River but today we're going to a very special vessel that is not this one this one is very special too this is the Kingston and we have Captain Shannon there at the helm and we are about to go to visit a boat that dates back all the way to 1931 and this boat is very special because it used to fight fires and it helped with a very terrible tragedy in American history, which was September 11th, 2001. We're going to learn all about that story of the John J. Harvey today here in the New York Harbor, part of Classic Harbor Line. I'm Ariel, let me know where you're watching from. And right now we are at Pier 62, which is close to 23rd Street here at Chelsea Piers. Hudson Yards is there in the distance and we are about to go towards the views of the trade, World Trade Center. And then we're gonna go into the John J. Harvey. And yes, we're gonna jump from one vessel, this one, to the other uh, later on in the show. And we're gonna meet two very special guests, Captain Huntley Gill, and also the engineer of the ship of the John J. Harvey, which we'll see soon, um, Jessica Dumont. So stay tuned, everyone. Let me know where you're watching from. Oh, I'm so excited uh, to see the historic John J. Harvey. I covered it back in 2017, and it's such a beautiful old ship uh, that has been beautifully preserved, and it has, it's so important to New York City and the effort that went to saving many lives during September 11th. So here we are seeing the views. Look at this. Wow. Right down there we have the One World Trade Center. Of course, the One World Trade Center was what ended up replacing what was the Twin Towers that unfortunately went down back in September 11, 2001. And then there in the distance, today is a clear day, so we're seeing the Verrazano Narrow Bridge built under the reign of Robert Moses. Right next to it, we have Jersey City. And let's talk to our very special guest today, we're getting choppy waters, have to have very good sea legs. Wow. Just take in these views before we talk to our guests. Just breathe in these views. <sighs> wow. All right. All right, let's go meet our guests. Captain Huntley and Jessica, if you can join me here in the front. Yes, both of you guys. Yeah. All right, well, we'll meet first Captain Huntley. Hello. How's it going? Pretty good. And this is like Jessica Dulong, which we'll talk to you next, yes. uh, the engineer of the ship. Uh, can you tell us, uh, as we see these views, if you could stand right over here. Sure. Um, and if you could hold this mic as well. Sure. What is the John J. Harvey? How did it get started? What's its, its initial origin story? Well, um, we are actually passing the berth here where John J. Harvey, who was built in 19, she was built in 1931, mm -hmm. um, and she was the first um, non-steam fireboat built uh, for New York and pretty much in the United States. She was an internal combustion boat, which was new. And she served from 1931 till 1995, and of those years, 1938 to 1994, was right there at Gansford right Street. There. Let me and the there you see Four Three, yeah, which is the boat that's in commission, and she is our replacement. And when Harvey was oh. built, she was the most powerful fireboat ever built. Really? She could do some 20,000 gallons of water a minute, and um, Three Four Three now is equivalent to the most powerful fireboats in the world. So it's pretty appropriate. And that's a very important number as well for uh, the story we're going to talk about in just right, a little bit. Right, the 343 yeah. firefighters who died on 9-11. Right. And then she has a sister um, boat called Firefighter, which is down in Staten Island. And the John J. Harvey, what, what was its ultimate fate? Uh, so it served as a fireboat for served, quite a while. It served as a fireboat, and I don't think she had, you know, they don't, I don't think they expected a life, hmm. a service life through 1995. But um, 
she was put into service, and she was large and fast and powerful. She had a younger sister called Firefighter, put into service in 38, about the same size, about the same capacity. And in 1957, Jessica will explain in more detail, um, the boat was, was, um, was uh, examined, and they considered whether or not it was time to retire her or continue in service. And she was right. in great shape. So they re-engined her with diesels in the same place as her original gasoline engines, and um, she served to 1995. And, you know, one of the things that Jessica talked about, one of her books is on the subject, is that these boats were built in an era when things were built for real, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> we have a boat that's still running 92 years later, and this is a pretty astounding thing. And um, uh, it's not something that happens very often with modern boats. Nothing else. Now, of course, it takes a lot of work as well. Work? No, not, not no. at all. No. no. <laughs> yeah, it does. All boats take a lot of work, yeah. and and the technologies have changed in many ways. I mean, that's a riveted hull. Mm. It's a different way of putting together hulls than we do today, and there aren't a lot of ship um, workers left, especially in the East Coast, that know how to deal with that. Luckily for Jessica, and her fellow engineers, the engineering is really wonderful and 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 um, and robust. Mm. And I'll let her talk more about that. Um, when we got the boat, we, we took off a lot of newer stuff and returned to um, kind of a lot of the original material. Fascinating. And we're gonna get on the boat very soon, the John J. Harvey. But uh, what's what's is it what is it doing today, right now? What's its function? Oh, well, it's a long, it's kind of a long story. I mean, yeah. a great friend of mine called Chase Wells and uh, John Crevy, who owned Pier 63, now Pier 66, one of the most incredible, creative, wonderful men I've ever known on the waterfront or anywhere else. Um, we had a boat in 1997, a wooden boat, and wood is, uh, as John Crevy used to say, food. So it was kind of constantly sinking, and we got, Chase and I got rid of it, and the project started in 1997 when basically John Crevy said, you know, there's a fireboat, and you should go buy this fireboat. And we said, how big? And he said, 130 feet overall, length overall, 440 tons, and we went, you're out of your mind, John. He said, no, 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 it's diesel, it's easy, I've got a pier, it'll be you know, free birth, no problem. <laughs> so, foolishly, we bought it, and I think we did, I've forgotten now, what we did, $27,010 in a, in a sealed auction bid because we were told somebody else was bidding $27,000. In fact, the next lower, lowest, next highest bid was $10,008 from a scrap oh, yard. Oh, no. <laughs> and the scrap yard would have just done what they do with old boats. Um, so we ended up owning this boat, and we got... Um, First, a great engineer, wonderful young guy called Tim Ivory, who um, can deal with modern boats, but really prefers not to. And right. he got a hold of this boat. We were running very quickly. And um, soon thereafter, we realized that we made a huge mistake, that this was an expensive prospect, and that we... So our first solution was to turn it into a Ponzi scheme, where we called up our friends and said, would you like to own part of a fire boat? And they'd go, how much? And you'd say, well, how much do they make? You know, you'd say 40,000 to one person, 5,000 to another. <laughs> and we did that for about a year, and then we ran out of friends. Okay. So, Good um, fundraising strategy. It was, it was interesting, but it comes to an end. Right. And a guy called Forner Harris, uh, an early volunteer, kept saying, guys, what are you doing? What are you doing? Not for profit. Not for profit. Right. And it suddenly dawned on us. So we created a not-for-profit that um, has a permanent easement on the boat, historic mm -hmm. easement. Um, she's on the National Register of Historic Places. And, and, and because... She was the first fireboat, internal combustion fireboat of that sort. She is the template mm. for every single fireboat that's followed in the world. Mm. So this is a really important vessel. And, and we faced a couple problems. One was that, or issues I should say. One was that um, she doesn't have a certificate of inspection from the Coast Guard, with good reason. Right. She's not set up for passengers. And the Coast Guard were wonderful. They looked at the boat. They realized that we weren't doing this just as a, a, a lark and that we were serious about it. And they offered to kind of waive certain things so we could get a certificate of inspection. But no matter what we did, we would have had to change the engine room and some of the historic aspects really pretty drastically. And that's not our purpose. Mm -hmm. So we said, thank you very much. And we keep the Coast Guard, you know, praised of what we do. But basically, we take people out for free. Right. And if we take people out for free, then that's perfectly in... in um, in accordance with Coast Guard regulations. We all have our licenses and we're well, that's careful great. about that. Um, it's great that people can uh, see this piece of history still I'm not alive and well. I'm not sure how it works. I've never really understood how we've been able to do this for 20 some odd years, but we do. And um, 
we raised the money. It's a 501c3, so luckily everything is deductible. Mm. We got two wonderful grants, one from um, the state, Environmental Protection Bond Act grant, and one called Save America's Treasures grant from the federal government, and that helped. And of course, we have Pier 66, where we are, where we have a free berth and a bunch of wonderful support from right. the owners of the pier. So everyone, stay tuned, because we'll meet Captain again as we go on the John J. Harvey. But as we see the views, thank you so much, uh, Captain Hunley. Uh, as we see the views of the One World Trade Center, um, you had a quite a interesting experience during September 11th. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so Jessica Dulong, you yes. are the engineer of the John Day Harvey. I was. Yeah. I am now Chief Engineer Emerita. I okay. am blissfully retired from engineering. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, what, what ended up happening on September 11th, 2001? So. Um, on September 11, 2001, uh, what happened was a whole lot of people did not predict the way that the day was going to go down, and there were a whole... Um, it was a sunny day like this as well. Yes, yeah. yes. And um, so this, the, the boat that we've been talking about, Fireboat John J. Harvey, um, was, was definitely no longer in even reserve status with uh, the Fire Department of New York. Um, so FDNY had made it quite clear that, um, you know, even when somebody cracked a joke, uh, that, the, that the boat had no business being anywhere near a working fire. Um, and of course, uh, all the rules changed that day in many different ways. Um, you can grab a seat. <laughs> it's about to get a little bit choppy. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so what happened that morning, Huntley can tell you a little bit about um, more clearly. I was not there that morning. Okay. Um, but essentially, uh, the boat was called back into service. And at first, the, the boat uh, moved about 150 passengers, I think, um, to appear further north. ...wait them out of, um, out of lower Manhattan to further north with clearer air. Um, a uh, then FDNY lieutenant, um, since retired as captain, um, reached out and and basically like chase got people to chase the boat down and call the boat back and say hey drop off your passengers can you pump water because that's what we need at the site right. and so because the boat had been so brilliantly made um, at a time when craftsmanship and and put together with. Um, such integrity of materials, the boat could still do the job for which he had been built to serve her city yet again. Um, and so... Uh, so it, was it used for its firefighting capabilities? Yes. So once the passengers were dropped off, yeah. the boat uh, came back to... Um, actually picked up passengers at south of South Cove and then came to just, just south of North Cove mm. and tied up um, and then um, began firefighting. Uh, supplying water to firefighters on land. Let me pause you there. Very, very soon as we go on the John J. Harvey, you'll learn about how the Harvey can fight fires. Yes, and so uh, the the challenge in this situation was that um, while North Cove is, is, you know, very close to where the Trade Towers had been, to get water with enough pressure um, inland, that far inland. So let me point the camera in this direction because yeah, yeah, just to visualize, yes. it is it is a quite a distance. Yes. Uh, because we still have like Battery Park City right in front. Exactly. Uh, and so what what fires was it trying to fight in that context? Well, so the the pile itself yeah. was burning for months. So obviously okay. on that morning there were still um, you know active fires. But uh, Tommy White is the the FDNY lieutenant at the time who, uh, who got Fireboat John J. Harvey back on scene. Mm. And he's the one who explained to me that there were just, you know, in the, in the, in the aftermath, we, we focus on the towers, which of course, right, that makes sense. But there were raging fires in the perimeter, just serious, like on any other day would have been a huge incident. And so there were fires burning throughout in, in everything from small scale like dumpsters to buildings. And, um, and so the firefighting water that was provided by the Hudson River exclusively at that point because the fire mains had been, um, uh, had so either the hydrants were covered by the collapse of the towers or the fire, 
fire mains had uh, been broken in the collapse of the tower. So that meant that Hudson River water was the only firefighting water available for days um, at, at the World Trade Center site. And it was provided by fireboat John J. Harvey, off du you know, uh, no longer active duty, but also the active duty boats. And they were lined up all along um, the southern seawall or the seawall, I should say, south of North Cove, and lined up all along and, um, and working together. And so, the, again, the pressure, we have you know, unlimited quantity when you're pumping river water, right? But the pressure is an issue. And so, um, over time, what got worked out with Tim Ivory, the then chief engineer who um, you know, masterminded how to get the water inland, um, there was a series of, uh, uh, there were hose lines stretched that were stretched and then um, attached sort of as a manifold to burned out pumpers that could no longer run, but they could still pump water. Um, and then uh, there was also this ingenious configuration of, um, of actually using the deck pipes, which we'll see later, which Huntley, you should explain this later when there's a good visual of, of the way that oh, Tim exactly, Ivory yeah. like took the nozzle tops off and stuffed them with uh, spring water bottles mm -hmm. to, to maintain the pressure sufficient to go out um, to where it was needed by firefighters. And who was the captain that went on that day? Huntley Gill yourself? was okay. there. I was there, and then the next day, um, I was there on 9-11, and then the next day we were joined by um, a wonderful, wonderful man, now dead, unfortunately, called Bob Lenny, um, who was a retired FDNY pilot of the boat. Mm. And he so loved John J. Harvey that when John J. Harvey was retired, he retired. <laughs> and he came back to help us learn about our boat, and he and Jessica got ferried over from Brooklyn um, on, the, on the 12th of September. So oh, they wow. joined us and helped us um, from then on, because basically the engineers had to be working 24 hours a day to keep this basically a huge, um, powerful uh, fire hydrant working. Yes. So is the water pumped from the Hudson? Yeah, so the way yeah. that I like to explain it to like kindergartners when we do ki tours you know, yeah. for kids is that we basically open up big mouths at the bottom of the boat mm. um, and it lets in the, the river water. And then they ask, what about the fish? And then I tell them that there's a screen that keeps the fish out. Although I will <laughs> tell you that we have, um, it doesn't keep out the, what are they, mussel spores or whatever grows mussels. We have grown mussels in our heat exchangers in the engine room oh, because they make it through. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so, so basically you're talking about unlimited water, it's, it's river water, and then the point of the fireboat is to be able to generate the, the pressure that's necessary and actually control the direction. And that's where the deck guns are um, and, and monitors are, are doing their, right. their job. Well, fascinating. And what was the entire maritime effort? Uh, what would have been the scene over here as we're passing through the Hudson uh, that day? So the first thing you would have seen was just just a horrific amount of smoke. And the wind shifted throughout the day, but there were periods you can see where those white, um, I don't know what the V-shaped roofing things. Oh, that's, yes. that's the modern day um, terminal for the um, waterway ferries. Mm. But the waterway ferries in particular, a huge role. And, and really from the very first minute, like within a minute, first plane hit, when people still thought this was just an accident, or a lot of people did, yeah. the ferries already knew that there was a transportation emergency at the very least. And so they shifted into gear and they started ferrying people off of Manhattan. Okay. Um, of course, the situation escalated rapidly um, and the, the ferries in particular were very well suited because they had their, their docking station, you know, their infrastructure set up. And, and they were going between uh, Manhattan and New Jersey? So they did, they did Manhattan and New Jersey because they could use what, you know, they could do their over and back, over and back, which they did every day. They served as waterborne ambulances for hundreds of people who oh, were wow. injured from the very first minute. Because, you know, when the first plane hit, you're talking about tremendous amounts of jet fuel. There were fire uh, fireballs that shot down the elevators. There were people coming mm -hmm. to the boat with clothing melted to them, with shards of glass in them. And, you know, I spoke oh, wow. with ferry captain, um, ferry captains and crews in researching my book, Saved at the Seawall, stories from the September 11th boat lift. And they talked about how they applied all of their first aid training that you're required to do to get your license. Oh, yeah. um, and so, and all their first aid kits and everything they could. 
but it wasn't just the ferry boats. It was every kind of boat you could think of. Um, so we have ferries and we have fire boats. What else would have been tug boats, fishing boats, boats, boats oh, dinner well. cruise boats? Um, when we were pulling out, um, we went right past Spirit of New York, mm. which actually ended up evacuating passengers. It's a huge vessel, and what they you know they can be very efficient in getting a lot of people on and a lot of people off. Right. Um, and so they made made trips back and forth and it wasn't just to um, you know directly across the river to New Jersey people went to Staten Island people went further south um, Jersey City was another place that a lot of people got dropped off the seas uh, <laughs> the Coast Guard right behind you the Coast excellent Guard, yeah. yes was the Coast Guard also involved I assume of course they uh, they were involved but actually they were involved in a really kind of amazing magical way which was yeah. they the uh, pretty late in the game at about 10:45. Um, is when For the, context, uh, everything started around 9? Uh, the first, I always block out these numbers. Okay, um, okay. It's part of my PTSD, quite oh, honestly, okay, so okay, I don't okay. know, but 8.50-something no okay. was the first. Um, but 10.45 was pretty late in the operation. There was already a real established um, uh, evacuation that was underway, and the Coast Guard did a remarkable thing. Um, then Lieutenant Mike Day came, and he didn't come in and say, all right, uh, Coast Guard's here, we're going to take this over. Instead, he worked to facilitate the operation that was already underway. So he teamed up with the Sandy Hook pilots and um, and took the Sandy Hook pilot boat, I think it was number one, New York, something like that, and, um, and, and used it as a sort of, you know, um, a, a command center of, of sorts. And from there, basically, um, helped provide information to mariners. So you have a bunch of vessels, you have fishing boats from Long Island, you have tugboats who are not designed to carry passengers, you have every kind of vessel that you can think of. And Jonathan is right now asking how many fire boats were involved aside from the Harvey? Good question. So, I mean, they were all involved. So there was... Thank you. The big boats were Firefighter, 1938. Yeah. McKean, 1954. And they, they were the bulk of the effort. We were just there to assist them. But I, I want to point out that this is one of the most important events in the history of the Fire Department of New York. And they were relying on a boat from 1931, 1938, and 1954. And that's all they could pull into right. this. So if you turn around, that's the result. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 343. Right so what are we looking built at? after that? Two of those, and our boat has a capacity of about 20,000 gallons a minute. 343 and her sister ship, Firefighter 2, have a capacity of 50,000 gallons a minute. So there was a period in New York history where they were not building fire boats. Exactly. Mm. Remember, the, the waterfront that we're on is now looking pretty nice, yeah. but it was all piers. It was right. all piers. This was the most important harbor in the world, and you had a pier pretty much every block, and the piers were made out of creosote piles, and they were wooden decks, and they might have had break buck cargo of all kinds of different things, clothing, and and gasoline and who knows what. So fires were happening constantly. Mm. There were three large fire boats on this part of the North River, according to Al Trajanowitz, our extremely wise historian. And those fire boats um, were out on calls maybe once or twice a day. I would be very surprised if 343 is out on a real call two or three times a year. And Ida is asking about the ownership of the pier. Um, are the piers public or, or private in general? And then. How did that work in terms of docking in order to for the effort? That's a really, yeah. really complicated question yeah, historically. Yeah, I, can imagine. Yes. Um, I mean, there were a whole series of um, graft-induced systems over the centuries. Okay. Um, but basically, by the time um, we think of post-World War II, it was all pretty much municipal-owned. I mean, if you'll take a look here, you'll see it still says on 57, which is now privately leased, Department of Marine, Avia mm. Marine and Aviation. That was one of the last agencies that was signed to the piers, but then the piers tended to be leased to one shipping company, Cunard or um, the French lines. The German lines were all in exile in Hoboken. I've never been quite sure why. <laughs> right. <laughs> but they were. Uh, basically little Germany for most And then of the other thing to think about is that, you know, this was basically, this harbor yeah. dealt with ships, but it was really a rail harbor. Okay. There's seven major rail lines that come into New York City, and only one of them comes into Manhattan directly with, with um, with uh, rail cars. All the others had to be on car floats, and where we are going now, Pier 66, where we will tie up, yeah. is a car float. It was designed to carry trains around the harbor. Mm. And so they too were carrying all kinds of great boat cargo. The harbor that we see today, luckily, was rescued from Westway, so we see 
a ghost of what was here. Here are two at Chelsea Piers, some of the last piers that are left. Right. Um, that gives you an idea. And these were very large piers. These were for ocean-going vessels. They actually had to dig back into landfill to make them long enough for the very large ships. But these were pretty typical in their system um, with these kind of racks for loading cargo. So imagine this port just completely jammed with activity, mostly rail and cargo and some passenger. Fireboats were an integral part of this and very important. And they were always in use, always. And that's one of the reasons, you know, we're doing the not-for-profit thing now, is you get somebody out on a boat like this, and we're taking them out for free on purpose. We want to get people out, Harbor, Classic Harbor Line, and, and the Circle Line, and all these other people serve this fantastic yeah. um, service by getting people out in the water. Like today. Right. I mean, <laughs> what could be a better thing in life, right? Exactly. Um, so our job is to try and introduce people mm. to the waterfront who might not other be interested or might not be able to afford and then hope that they go out in the classic harbor line and all the others um, at least once a week for the rest of their lives <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so it's a very important part of it and what we do is get people out and and try and get them familiar with the fact that we live in a city that doesn't think much about the harbor but the, it exists because of the water right new york city that would not exist except for the water new york city would not be one of the great cities of the world except for the erie canal and its connection to chicago right. and the like and so the harbor is is so essential to our history and keeping boats like this from 1931 going mm -hmm. not just sitting on land and looking pretty not just <laughs> in some museum but actually running now we're, we're so it, that right? people get the experience oh we're gonna that's see really soon. crucial okay there we are and she's um, newly painted, so I want you to notice how incredibly oh, good yeah, she definitely. looks. We were just in the yard. <laughs> Pay no attention to the tires over the side, they're very ugly. And they're not normally So good. pardon, which one, it's the one in, in the back? No, yes. we're going to see it. With the big two. On. The, one with the, big two. Okay. the one with the big two is a fry, uh, is, is fry, Jay Harvey. In front of her is Frying Pan. Okay. Similar era, and she was a light ship. And she would literally, she was from Frying Pan Shoals off North Carolina. And she was literally permanently anchored, and she would just be... A, um, a, a lighthouse, a floating mm. lighthouse. And she's now part of our host um, berth at Pier 66. Right. And um, it is really one of the most fun bars there is in New York. And, and you, we're you know. about to board it. Yep. And um, pardon to ask the obvious, but how does it, uh, what's its duties? What are the duties of fireboats today? Um, there's today, I think, well, I know. Yeah. It's because interesting in, because in, for on land, their trucks have different uh, fireboats. Always purposes. have a yeah. act, acted as as basically hydrants. Sometimes okay. they're using their their deck pipes. More often than not, they would go to a fire. There would be a land based fire company on the pier if it was a pier fire. Mm -hmm. They would hook up to the fireboat and and help the fireboat's crew. But it could be a land based company of 20, 30, 40. We should really ask Al Trujanowitz, our historian. Okay. Um, and today, I think the unspoken idea behind 343 and firefighter is that if god forbid there's another the blitz in london is a good parallel every time there were fires in london during world war ii it was fireboats that were mm. providing the water and i think that's the basic function now is that just in case we don't need it very often boy when you need it you don't have any choice of course so yeah. that's really what we're about Wonderful. no okay we'll resume on, on the boat uh See you in a little bit. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, let me show over here. You all look so efficient. <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> are we being taken over or are we taking over you? <laughs> I don't know what to do with this one. There's no rust. So ladies and gentlemen, yes, we are about to go from one boat to the other. First time live here uh, from what I've done on my Urbanist videos. And Classic Harbor Line, I assume, has not covered this yet. All right, let me show you. I'm going to do a bow. Can I do a bow? Yeah. Here we have Sarah working with Classic Harbor Lines, putting the ropes around. We're getting two of the boats together. Make sure they don't crash. And make sure we're still afloat. <laughs> Lots of arm strength. It takes to 
do all this work. So round of hearts for these gentlemen right here, pulling both boats together. Let's uh, see how it looks like. This is so exciting. <laughs> First time I've ever seen this, well, at least in person. I've seen this in video games like Assassin's Creed 3, where they have naval battles. Ida says, thank you so much for answering my question. Yeah, my pleasure, Ida. So here we are seeing right now the Harvey. We're going to go on it. In just a little bit, we're going to learn about that very soon. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. Right. <laughs> great, great strength. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. Thank you so much. You can hold it. You can face it in that direction. Yeah. You can point the camera towards me. All right, I'm putting on a life jacket. <laughs> Not sure if I'm putting this right, but. Uh, so we've got these ones being pulled. Are you guys having anything else to pull down in there? Yes, Confused. I'm going to climb the board, you'll hand it to yeah. me. Yeah, cool. Sounds good. You have the bags? All the bags are up here. Cool. Awesome. I would like not to do the climbing board. I want us to do the most you win. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. All right. Yes. Boarded the ship. <laughs> Thank you for the life jacket. Hi. How you doing? Hey. Larry. Ariel. <laughs> Hello there. How's everything going? That was fun. <laughs> That's how the pirates felt back in the uh, 1700s. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna show this first and then we'll do the tour around the boat, yeah. So right now the are the Kingston from Classic Harbor Line. Classic Harbor Line, if you're tuning in and not fully aware, if you're watching from my channel, they do tours all around the city. Uh, exploring uh, the New York Harbor, showing showcasing it to people uh, from all around the world, locals and tourists alike. Uh, they do jazz tours, architecture tours, all types of tours. Um, this boarding thing is more of a special thing that we're doing for today. Uh, so this is not a normal thing, but really cool service. Highly recommend checking them out, Classic Harbor Line. Uh, Jonathan says, cool, active fireboat. Oh, yes. So we're going to show you the fireboat very soon. But right now, let me show you how the... the Unboarding process goes. I'm not sure how the proper terminology for it. May we have a few. Susie says, "Hope the 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 life jacket was on tight." Luckily, it was not necessary uh, because it was fairly easy to board, <laughs> and the seas were the river is pretty calm, at least. So, I made it. All right. So they are off. Woo! Kingston is going back to Pier 62. Nice Ida says this is a 1930. I think so, yeah. My bag is on that. Oh. 
Oh, no, 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 we're not. No, no. Oh, that's no. a problem. The hardest one floating? All right. So you want to take a look at the yeah, let's do it. I got to hand this so off to Sarah. What's happening now? Sarah, if you could grab this. Yes, Thank you. that was great. Thank you. We're alive. <laughs> that was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, the most harrowing one. Right, so right. I'll just wear this for a second. I got to reconnect to how my uh, pirate ancestors felt in Puerto Rico. <laughs> All right, let's do a tour of the John J. Harvey. Um, sure, let's show you the wheelhouse, Captain which is Gill. not as interesting as yeah. Jessica's engine room, but we'll start okay. there. Okay, we'll do that first. Perfect. So we're walking through the gold room, which is where all of the nozzles and things for firefighting were. There's a head on this level since wow. the pilots didn't want to have to pee with the engineers. <laughs> they have another one downstairs. Oh, I can imagine. Let me show this. Yeah, this would have all had nozzles like this, which is bronze, obviously, but yeah. they called it the gold room because of the color. And different nozzles for different... Different conditions, different conditions. pressure that you want. Sometimes okay. they're spray nozzles, sometimes they're foam nozzles. And here we see them in things. action right here. Exactly. Yeah. Wonderful. And then uh, for the rides, you do a demonstration, which I captured on live video many years ago. Uh, you do demonstrations, right? Otherwise uh, we're a tugboat. Of well, course we yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. All right. Let's go upstairs. So, there's a nice division in time in this wheelhouse. Yeah. From here down, we're still in 1931. <laughs> oh, fascinating. From there up, we've given in to technology. <laughs> right, right. Um, because this, although, the, you know, this boat was the first fire boat in the United States, as far as I know, to have a radio. Mm. And um, uh, Mayor LaGuardia was on board for the inauguration service. He was a total fan of fires and fire boats and fire engines. And, sort of thing. So there are lots of pictures of him kind of making the first radio broadcast from a fireboat. Oh, that's fascinating. Wow, and, and then now what, what does this do? Pardon, uh, the two wheels. Your, there's an electric system. wheel that is the one that we hope to use all the time. Okay. And then there's a much larger one that's only for emergencies if the electric motor fails or something goes wrong. Mm. And the most interesting thing, and I'm, if we can get ah. to the engine room, are the telegraphs. This boat yes. was built in 1931, and as I explained, in 1931 everything before this was steam. And if you had a steamboat, you had to have Somebody down there dealing with valves and reversing stuff, there was no alternative. So you had a telegraph, just like you see in the movies. You know, you signal down, there's like another the telegraph. Like the Titanic? Precisely. Okay. And then there's another telegraph at the station downstairs, mm. and those engineers would deal with it. When they did this boat, boat, telegraph. Didn't need it. I mean, right. it could have been direct pilot house control. Quiet radio. But, um, <laughs> But they put a telegraph on, which is one of the reasons actually the fire department was not particularly happy with the boat over the years because it required you had an extra person. Right. Then men, now often women. Mm -hmm. Because you had to have literally somebody down there full time at the stand. Because I'm, when I'm steering, I suggest yeah. with the telegraph what I would like to do. <laughs> and um, they take it under advisement in the engine room. And if <laughs> things are good, they do it right away. Okay. <laughs> and then they signal back. So it's not quite orders. <laughs> No, well, it is orders. Yeah, it is orders. We Technically. like to think it's orders, but we're polite. It's a volunteer organization. Uh, so what were we looking at in terms of the signage? Full stern, half stern, slow ahead. We're finished with engines now, so okay. we're off. Standby means just go to idle, and this is forward. And there are two, there are two um, motors, electric mm. motors, that run the boat. And right. um, it has five now diesel engines, originally gasoline, always um, internal combustion. Mm. And they have generators on one end, which Jessica will show you later, mm. and um, fire pumps on four out of the five engines. Oh, and those generators, we only use three engines at once generally, um, create 600 volts DC, mm. and that runs two big electric motors, and that's what runs the boat. Mm. And it's good because you can, they work very quickly, which is important. This boat only has one rudder and two propellers, which makes it very difficult to maneuver in close, hmm. which is counterintuitive for a fireboat that was built to work in close. But it was designed by a yacht designer called Gilo, and it was the Depression, and he was out of work. So, <laughs> right, right, you know. Oh, fascinating. And okay. he, what he really wanted was the most beautiful stern on any fireboat in history, and he got it. Yeah. Because if you have two rudders, you have to have a big boxy stern, uh. one for each rudder post. Here he has a beautiful stern. 
We have the nicest ass in the harbor, I'd like to say. <laughs> oh, I love that. So then, Jessica, if you can, if you think you can, uh, if, if the, take yes, it but first you have to. There's Bob Lenny right oh, there. Yes. We were talking about earlier. This is. This is the man that saved us from ourselves. Okay. Bob Lenny was, worked on the boat from, I'm going to say, 73 or maybe 69? It was, two, it was two decades. Two so, decades. Yeah, yeah. So I think it was, um, right, because he finished in 1994, right? Yeah. Right? And yeah. we took down the opera singing picture of him. No, there was. Jonathan, uh, sorry to interrupt, Bob. Uh, Jonathan is asking, is this where the captain. Uh, yes. Stays, yes. This is where we steer. Yeah. And where Bob Lenny steered for years and years. 63. He started in 1963, mm -hmm. did it through 1975, came on the boat about the second or third trip we went out, okay. looked around and saw a bunch of guys with ties, decided his boat was doomed, and, <laughs> and kind of said, Do you mind if I steer? And we said, No, please, because we really didn't know what we were doing. And he basically taught us all about the boat, and he was just oh, cool. also one of those great you know, gruff, Irish, American type of guys who pretended to be really tough, but he was just a, he was a big sweetheart. And oh, that's amazing. all really adored him. Jessica and Tim, I think really, um, you know, he, through all the travails that volunteer, that engineers go, hard work, long hours, a lot of stuff that the rest of us, pen, you know, kind of, kind of lightweights don't have to do. I think it was Bob that kept them going. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Oh, wonderful. And then, um, Wow, okay. Is there anything else? So what was this? The bed over here. Is this a bed? What That's is this? a bed. If you have a really, really long <laughs> okay. fire, you know, you can oh, take I a nap. See. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, perfect. All right, let's 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 learn all about down? the engineering out of the ship. Uh, which way do you want to go down? The phone Up to you. Okay. Let's whatever you that? recommend. Port side. You have to go port side? You have to go port side? Go ahead. Is it port side? No, there's a big gangway. Yeah. <laughs> Now we're going to go into the bowels oh, that's of right, the ship. The cool cruise quarters. Yes, with the new enhancements. We have to do that. Okay. <laughs> so, volunteer project. Um, yeah. Uh, smells strong. What does that smell that? That's the diesel. Very that's sharp smell. Diesel yeah. fresh. Diesel, okay. Yes. Um, so, the. Uh, we had have a great group of volunteers, and um, a recent project, if you want yeah. to check out in here, is to sort of bring this back to a period piece. Oh, wow. Of, uh, Saltine crackers. Yes, yes. I think they did a <laughs> brilliant job of it. Yes, you just have to, like, you Chock know. full of nuts. Oh, my God. Ignore some of the modern equipment in there. But, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they did a really good job of that. But this is a cruise quarters. Um, and so... Cruise uh, quarters, so they sleep here. Yeah, so huh. um, it was the case that they um, that the engineers would stay mm. on board the boat um, mm. because they had to keep everything running I think it was 80 degrees like the engine room had to stay at 80 degrees and so they um, so that things could um, operate very quickly yeah um, and so engineers so the pilot uh, stayed in the uh, firehouse is my understanding and the engineers stayed on board um, oh, and they had to stay 80 degrees uh, yeah down here. yeah and then uh, what's the, the sounds we're hearing uh, uh, you, the clanking. You're probably hearing the squeaking of the lines. Okay. Um, so the ship lines are, you know, attaching the boat to the pier. Uh, um, Susan yeah. says that this is the heartbeat of the ship. Oh, not yet. Yeah. Not yet. Okay. We'll okay. get to the heartbeat right, right in here. So watch your step. All right. Yes, and the smell Ooh. is the diesel fresh. Gasoline from a uh, car gasoline. <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, but you know, if you're you know behind a, a tractor on the highway, right? Diesel, right? Diesel is a common, common experience. So um, maybe so. This is a great visual, I think. Um, and what's funny is that you have people down here, and because we are so sheltered in this in this life that we lead now, where right. everything that might kill you is like behind you know bulletproof glass or whatever. <laughs> I, I've I've had the experience where people are just like, "What's that?" You know, like not getting the fact that this is actually the the electrical oh. panel oh, wow. um, that's okay. that's controlling the auxiliaries for the boat. There's um, not enough danger signs here. I know, right? <laughs> um, and so it's like full full Frankenstein. We can fry you very quickly if you'd oh, like. Fascinating. And if this is not enough voltage for you, yeah. we can fry you even more on the back, um, on the back. electrical panel, which I'll show you. But okay. So this um, up forward, you see two two of the five diesel engines, but back here you might be able to get a better vantage point. Um, so two engines up forward, three aft. Um, each of these engines is connected on either end. Wait, 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 wait so, sorry, okay. uh, what are the engines? We'll, we'll the point en them out. Okay. okay, okay. Maybe we'll go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> At that level. 
Okay, so here we because go. Because I'm just seeing a blob of machinery. Okay, this <laughs> from my point of view. This <laughs> is a diesel engine. They're Fairbanks Moore supposed okay. piston diesels. Um, they're five and a quarter inch bore. Yeah. They are um, uh, each connected to um, to two components, right? So the first component is the generator end. So oh, Westinghouse equipment. So basically what happens oh, is, nice. as I explain it to the kids, the uppy downy motion that's happening here yeah. gets turned into round and round motion that goes over there. Oh, and cool. that's how we generate the electricity that actually fuels the propulsion mm -hmm. motors, which I'll show you in the back. Um, the other, on the other end of the engine, um, all the four outboard engines is the pump. So this is a pump right here. So basically all this gray piping yeah. that you see and the green valves, this is all part of the fire main system. Okay. So the mouth at the bottom of the boat that I talked about earlier, that's yeah. like there's one of those down there and it opens up and then fills these pipes and then these pumps, there are four of them. Oh, so you're pumping water from the Hudson right now? Yes. Or, or uh, when, 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 when they're in engaged, okay. correct. Um, and so, um, and the engine, the pump is direct drive off mm. of the engine, and so when it's time to pump water, we engage an air flex, we'll idle down, and then engage an air flex clutch, um, so that, that again, that, um, that motion gets translated again to the rotation that you need to do a job, right? Panagiotis from Greece is saying, my brain is on fire because I love engineering. <laughs> oh, excellent, yeah. excellent. Well, it got very dark in here. Um, if, if we could turn on the lights one more time, that would be great, yeah. Uh, something probably tripped. In any event, you may, I'm not sure how good your camera is, but basically, so I explained to you all four of the outboards. Okay. The center line engine is a different story, and if we come Let's down go, here, yeah. you should be you should be clear to come without. Okay, cool. It's warm, so don't touch. Okay, they, don't touch. Uh, warmed up the engines earlier. Um, it's great we did this in the dark, so we can uh, excellent. not see where's the hot part. No, I'm joking. <laughs> okay, so so <laughs> this it? engine, yeah. the centerline engine, is is unique here in that it is connected to two separate generators. These are the two separate generators. So what that means mm. is, so this boat was built with redundancy in mind and and um, basically to make sure that the job could get done. Right, okay. it's, it's an emergency services vessel, and so. Um, the, so not only do we have redundancy in terms of which engine you can use to, to run propulsion, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's, again, it's not, you're not turning the propellers with the rotational motion of the engine. You're mm -hmm. doing it with the electricity that's generated by the generator ends on the engines, right? Oh, if that's clear. Yeah. So um, what that means is that we can configure in different ways so that, um, some of the engines are contributing to that generation of electricity. Others are pumping. They can be doing both at once. Mm -hmm. Here is where you can get a balance of power. So with this centerline engine, our current chief engineer, John Brown, and his engineering team, because again, I'm blissfully retired, yes. um, <laughs> can, um, can swap power so that half of this engine can be powering the port side and oh, half can be powering the starboard oh, side. Perfect. And now you can really see what's yes. going on. Ooh, what are so, we looking from the yes, these are the propulsion motors oh, okay. so basically again the um the the electricity that's you can see everything is die down zoom. here <laughs> Lots of um, so uh engineers have to be very careful yeah maritime reality um, so and then i think we're running out of cell phone reception here oh so let's okay go a little bit further in okay, the front okay so maybe let's you can around. see yeah. if you just step right here you can All see right. the larger frankenstein panel where we can sizzle okay, you perfect um, if you see us and hear us right now, we are, of course, immersed in a pile of steel, so. <laughs> but if we <laughs> come forward, you should question again, and I can All show right, you right. the telegraphs on this end. Perfect. Um, so, basically, there's, you know. It, oh, it is warm. Yeah, there's nice. no, uh, yeah, and that's barely. So, they just repeat about the engineers, up. because we were uh, down so for a while. So, this yeah. is the amazing hey, chief going? engineer, John Brown. Nice, nice to meet you. Um, and he is the one who is responsible for how magical and wonderful this oh, wonderful. looks right now. Far better than when I was here, i got to tell a tight you. Ship. I love it. Yes. Oh, tight ships are good. Doing a really, really good job. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> So this is the other end of that telegraph operation. Okay. So basically when, um, here I'll do it this way so yeah. you can see. So this is what Huntley, this is where he issues, or the any pilot issues their strong suggestions for how oh, fast so that they is go, go. that signal's going up to. With those little bicycle chains. Very modern technology, yeah. bicycle. Yeah. Oh, the bicycle, okay, okay, I see. So that means that there's an engineer stationed down here yeah. 
20, like the whole time, just yeah. standing here waiting to follow these orders right here. Even and then, modern day? Even modern day. Okay. Yeah, there's That's no it. other way to run the boat. Oh. So then these levers are actually controlling the output of the generator ends of those engines mm. that are then feeding the prop motors. So one for the port side, one for the starboard side. So for simplicity's sake, this connects up to the helm and then the engineer just relays all those controls with these. Yeah, so, okay. and, yeah, and just to reinforce the point, this is the only control mm. that the pilot has over the boat. Is the power of suggestion, <laughs> <Okay>. right? <laughs> Fascinating. Um, and you in actually make modern the vessels. Here. It would be different in the three four three. Would it be different? Oh yes, very much okay. so. Yeah, okay. because you'd have like computer panels and you know and indicators. This is all very rudimentary. Engineers in the yeah. wheelhouse, which is really not allowable. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> I'm glad all of this is preserved too. Um, are, are, do these historic ships have danger of be, being gutted and restructured engineering-wise, or is that usually not No, they're the usually scrapped. They're usually scrapped. Yeah, scrapped. Okay. And that's one of the points, is that when Tim and Jessica, and when we took over the boat, and John follows the same basic thing. We never put in anything modern if we don't need to. And in fact, yeah. a bunch of modern stuff that was down here came off. Okay. It worked really well in 1931. It's working pretty well. Um, in 2023, and there's no reason it shouldn't keep going for another 20 I years. Agree. <laughs> cool. It's a lot of work, but we keep why. it going. Oh, oh that's work. wonderful. Yeah. yeah, and we should also point out, too, that while well, John and, and a couple of his guys are professionals, yeah. and Jessica's a professional, everything else here is all volunteer. This is all done with unpaid labor. Wow. Great stuff. We love it. <laughs> Everyone, a round of hearts and likes for the people who work in these vessels for free, unpaid labor. That's one. Yep. that's wonderful that they're volunteering to keep history alive. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah. But this boat, this boat has an effect on people, and what's yeah, what's most does. the most magical thing about this project is that it brings together people, wildly different people with wildly different views, backgrounds, experiences, and everybody comes together out of the love of this boat. Yes. And so it's just one of the few spaces I think exists now, especially where we're so divided and so in our little bubbles. Mm -hmm. This is a place where people come together from just every single vantage point you could think of and work together and get the job done and have a really fun time doing it. Right, right. And then this is all American engineering too? Um, at, least, at least I would say a uh, portion of it, like the Westinghouse. But yeah. built in Gowanus Bay. Oh, we wow. built in Gowanus Bay. Wow, we wonderful. could have gone there yeah. today, you know, without too much effort. And Panagiotis from Greece says uh, the maintenance cost must be really high. Yes. So yeah. we the take drachmas, we take any, we take lira, we take <laughs> francs, we take Deutschmark, so they don't exist anymore. No. We take euros, Those we euros. take pound sterling. <laughs> It does. It's yeah. a lot of, it's, you know, we have a budget that's a sort of mysteriously raised every year. Right. And all, it's all through not-for-profit donations. Okay. And somehow we take people out for free. I just don't get it. We've been doing it for 22 years, 23 years, and I still don't understand well, how it works. Well, it's a whole lot of work. Well, we have a treasurer. He knows how it works, but he doesn't <laughs> yes. tell me. You accept donations, of course, right? That's, that's the lifeblood of the ship. The okay, volunteers wonderful. and donations, tax, you tax can people, deductible donations. Where um, donate if they want to? Um, on, the, on our website, fireboat.org. Okay. Okay. If you can't remember that, then you're really in trouble. Um, <laughs> but it also has an on-site you know, on um, donation thing. And it also, they're very, very in demand. We can't do too many free trips every year because yeah. they cost us money. But we do post them, and, and we can take, uh, we take uh, every other week or so, we'll take two or three free trips. And we encourage people to, to join us. Oh, nice. All right, let's see the pumps on top. Oh, the, the deck, the deck yeah. guns. Yeah, yes. the deck guns. Yeah, that'd be great. Would you like to show them the deck guns? Go for it. Okay, let's go that. for the deck guns. All right, I'm excited. Come on up. I can't get it. All right, let's go up. Will you guys be joining us a little bit later? Or okay, cool. All right, go. Is he doing all your tours? He's doing all our live streams. All right, the deck guns. Wow. Okay. Okay. On this boat, we have eight deck guns, and the larger deck guns are yeah. 3,000 gallons per minute each, and the smaller ones are 2,000 gallon, gallon each. So that one right up there is uh, That's a 2,000. 2,000, okay. And the larger one is 1,000 gallon per minute. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, if you take all the eight deck pipes and put them together, you got yeah. 18,000 gallons. 18,000 gallons per minute. That's what the boat's capable of. Wow. We have four pumps. Is that, sorry to interrupt, is that pressure dangerous for anyone who's standing in front of it? Well, yes, it would yeah. definitely throw you off the side of the ship. Okay. 
but um, but it wouldn't be aimed at a person, obviously. It'd of be course. aimed at the seat of a fire right. to cool it down and to remove the oxygen to put out a fire. So what we're we seeing right now, over here, we have another of the deck guns as well. Yes, yeah, so and that one's a smaller one, and there's one missing because it's out for repair, as you see right here. Okay. So we capped that because they're all getting kind of old now. They're 92 years old, and they're starting to leak pretty bad. So let me, let me show this one a little bit closer. Yes. Yeah. So what were you saying? So yes, that's a 2000, mm -hmm. and, uh, but all of our deck guns are starting to leak, so we're sending them out one at a time to be rebuilt. Oh, good, good. Yeah. And um, what's the distance that these uh, well, that water can, streams could go? Well, first of all, they shoot uh, compound pressure, okay. okay, basically volume. And uh, uh, I know that the bow pipe, the forward pipe, if you want to go up and see oh, it while we're talking, that the forward pipe has shot over to George Washington Bridge. Over it? Over it, over the roadway. Uh, for context, how tall is the George Washington Bridge? Uh, I'm guessing around 600 feet. Wow, that's impressive. So this so, is the one. Yeah, this is the big pipe. And I, I actually captured this on a live video back in 2017. If someone could find it, feel free to leave the link. But sure. wow, that's impressive. Yes, yeah, she's a nice, uh, nice boat here. Yeah, yeah. Puts out a lot of water. Now we have four pumps that feed these eight deck pipes and they're called the Courtney pumps mm -hmm. and they were built in Newark, New Jersey, which is a long time out of business. And we can have parts made for them, but we can't obviously buy any parts. Mm -hmm. um, so right now we have two pumps that are working and two that need to be rebuilt at some point. Rebuilt, oh, okay, so it's, uh, it's hard to do any repairs quickly. So yes. Nowadays. Yes. Everything yeah. is a project where you might have to have it casted or made in a machine shop. Mm. Impressive. And does someone have to be on con in control of it? Well, if they're yeah. fighting a fire, one guy would direct it at the parts of the fire that okay. they need to uh, head out. pull down. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. So much. It was wonderful again. It was such Thank a you. Pleasure to meet yes. You. Thank pleasure you to so meet you much, too, Mr. Brown. I'm okay. You are amazing. Thank you. I appreciate Bye. it. Good to see you, hon. We'll do one more minute. Let us know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, so, yes, what you were saying, uh, one man controls it. Yeah, well, uh, one person controls it. Well, normally there used to be a, a crew of eight firemen uh, yeah. on the boat. Now, one would be a captain, one would be a pilot, and there'd be four engineers. So, a minimum of six guys, but it's normally eight. And when they're fighting a fire and using the deck guns, they would, you know, uh, shoot the, the water at the seat of the fire. Mm. You know. uh, so they have to direct them and move them around. As the fire starts to go out, they do have to move them. Christine asks, uh, are reconstructed pumps identical or, or are they modernized when you're repairing no, them? No, they're original. Original? They're all original. Oh, yeah, wow. they, and okay. two of them are still working. Uh, but they do need a little rebuilding and at the same token, they could use some packing. They have the old packing glands and you have to put packing in there and you have to tighten the packing gland to keep it from leaking. But they're wearing out, so. And for a ship like the 343, is the technology different I'm nowadays? I'm sure they probably have regular modern seals mm -hmm. in them instead of packing. Okay. I would gather. Wow, fascinating. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That was yeah, a great, my pleasure. great tour. I Thank love you. that. Okay. Thank you. You got yeah. it. All right, let me go back to Captain Gill. Captain I'm sure we'll... There we go. All right. So. people can go on the John J. Harvey and see it themselves. Let us know. That was a wonderful experience showing us all around the uh, John J. Harvey. I would recommend coming here in person because it's truly impressive. But I'm and also visiting the pier. I mean, Pier yeah. 66 is such a cool place. Because we're, yeah, we're right next to a bar, the frying pan as well as right next. And a yeah. restaurant. It's really one of the most happening places on the west side. Yeah. End of uh, Pier 66, end of West 26th Street. Right, right. And so how can people find more about the John J. Harvey? Fire, um, the website is great. We have um, our history section by Al Trujanowitz, our historians, retired dispatcher for the fire department, has a lot of information. And if you ever any, have any questions, there's a contact us um, section on the website, and okay. um, we can always answer them. Perfect. So now thank we're going to go out and do some water. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Sure. Yeah. What do you mean doing some water? We're going to go out and spray some water. Oh, right now? Right now. Oh! I was about to end, end the broadcast, but we're doing this. Okay, so let me show it. Awesome. Yep, great. Perfect.
Okay, everyone, we're going to see some uh, water being sprayed from inside the helm. Hopefully the, the patrons of the bar or restaurant are not in the splash zone. Hopefully the hoses are set in the right direction. Hey, how's it going? All right. Susie says, oh, ooh, water. Yes. We're going to see this one in the front, right? So water's being pumped at the moment. We're gonna go out. Yeah. Middle of the river. We shoot some water. Okay. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Perfect. All right. Let's do that. Okay. So we're gonna go out onto the river, and that's where we're gonna see some water being spurted out. We're not fighting any fires, but. But we are going to uh, show you how it would fight fires. And this is part of the experience on the J. John J. Harvey, which you can do yourself uh, after you take a classic Harbor Line cruise. on headphones because things are about to get a little bit loud. to know this is indeed a bar you can visit yourself after going on the classic Harper line cruise then going on the John Jay Harvey then you can finish off with a nice beer the frying pan I'm not sure if this there's another bar here as well but it's a bar restaurant
you have any questions, feel free to ask about the Don J. Harvey or about New York. Happy to answer them if I can. Jonathan asks, how high does the water spray? Well, as the engineer mentioned earlier, uh, they sprayed over the George Washington Bridge, which is uh, quite high already. Uh, if anyone can let us know the height of the George Washington, let us know. It's flooding a little harder than it. It's flooding a little harder than it. Christine, have they uh, fought any fires? No, they have not fought any fires. And how many people can they take on board? I'm not entirely sure, but I'll see if I can ask. Well, get loud. There's no. Oh, okay. Cool. All right. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Around this way. Okay. Perfect. Oh wow. Okay. So I'm getting a little bit wet, but there we go. Look at that, everyone. The hoses.
was amazing. Great show. <laughs> I that love it. doesn't turn you into a six-year-old, nothing will. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> oh, it was great, especially with the rainbows and everything. Yeah, your crew got soaked. Oh, yeah, that's Does that fun. happen yeah. all the time? Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Good. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> that is amazing. And then what, what do you do? What ends up happening for the rest of the trip, usually when tourists are here? If we yeah. have, um, we think of ourselves as cultural tourists. Right, right, right. Generally, right. we'll go around, we'll talk a little bit about the harbor, and it's because this boat, fire boats are built for fires, but they're also celebratory. Right. So, um, we will also uh, do what we always do, we celebrate with the water display, mm. and we've been doing that for ships coming in and out of harbor, for special events, and the Statue of Liberty for 92 years. Oh, wow. So, we almost always go to the Statue of Liberty. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, wow, well, wonderful. And there, down there is the George Washington Bridge, which apparently that pump pumped water above the bridge. It's not a pump oh. full. We have a film. It's a, oh, it is? We oh, wow, film. there is proof. It was before the roadway had opened, so we couldn't knock any Model A's off the bridge. <laughs> All right, everyone. Not a, not a legend. Actual real history. Right down there, the water went over the George Washington Bridge. Go... Go to fireboat.org to check out more about the John J. Harvey, around the parts to Captain Gill and the engineer, former engineer, Jessica Dulong, and Classic Harbor Lines. Check out their tours at Classic Harbor Line. Go to Classic Harbor Line on their website, and there's tours all year round, all throughout the week. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in. Keep being awesome, and always keep on exploring, and stay curious, my friends. Have a great day. Yeah, yeah. Bye-bye.